Wednesday, 23 February, 1944. Dear Kitty, it's lovely weather outside, and I've quite perked up since yesterday. Nearly every morning I go to the attic where Pater works to blow the stuffy air out of my lungs. From my favorite spot on the floor, I look up at the blue sky and the bare chestnut tree, on whose branches little raindrops shine, appearing like silver, and at the seagulls and the other birds as they glide on the wind. He stood with his head against a thick beam, and I sat down. We breathed the fresh air, looked outside, and both felt that the spell should not be broken by words. We remained like this for a long time, and when he had to go up to the loft to chop wood, I knew that he was a nice fellow. He climbed the ladder, and I followed. Then he chopped wood for about a quarter of an hour, during which time we still remained silent. I watched him from where I stood, he was obviously doing his best to show off his strength. But I looked out of the open window, too, over a large area of Amsterdam, all over the roofs and onto the horizon, which was such a pale blue that it was hard to see the dividing line. As long as this exists, I thought, and I may live to see it, this sunshine, the cloudless skies, while this lasts, I cannot be unhappy. The best remedy for those who are afraid, lonely, or unhappy is to go outside, somewhere where they can be quite alone with the heavens, nature, and God, because only then does one feel that it is all as it should be, and that God wishes to see people happy amidst the simple beauty of nature. As long as this exists, and it certainly always will, I know that then there will always be comfort for every sorrow, whatever the circumstances may be, and I firmly believe that nature brings solace in all troubles. Oh, who knows? Perhaps it won't be long before I share this overwhelming feeling of bliss with someone who feels the same way as I do about it. A thought. Yours, Anna. We miss so much here, so very much, and for so long now. I miss it too, just as you do. I'm not talking of outward things, for we are looked after in that way. No, I mean the inward things. Like you, I long for freedom and fresh air. But I believe now that we have ample compensation for our privations. I realized this quite suddenly when I sat in front of the window this morning. I mean inward compensation. When I looked outside, right into the depth of nature and God, then I was happy, really happy. And, Pater, so long as I have that happiness here, the joy in nature, health, and a lot more besides, all the while one has that, one can always recapture happiness. Riches can all be lost, but that happiness in your own heart can only be veiled, and it will still bring you happiness again as long as you live, as long as you can look fearlessly up into the heavens, as long as you know that you are pure within and that you will still find happiness. Sunday, 27 February, 1944. Dearest Kitty, from early in the morning till late at night, I really do hardly anything else but think of Pater. I sleep with his image before my eyes, dream about him, and he is still looking at me when I awake. I have a strong feeling that Pater and I are really not so different as we would appear to be, and I will tell you why. We both lack a mother. His is too superficial, loves flirting, and doesn't trouble much about what he thinks. Mine doesn't bother about me, but lacks sensitiveness, real motherliness. Pater and I both wrestle with our inner feelings. We are still uncertain and are really too sensitive to be roughly treated. If we are, then my reaction is to get away from it all. But as that is impossible, I hide my feelings, throw my weight about the place, am noisy and boisterous, so that everyone wishes that I was out of the way. He, on the contrary, shuts himself up, hardly talks at all, is quiet, daydreams, and in his way carefully conceals his true self. But how and when we shall finally reach each other, I don't know quite how long my common sense will keep this longing under control. Yours, Anna. Monday, 28 February, 1944. Dearest Kitty, it is becoming a bad dream, in daytime as well as at night. I see him nearly all the time and can't get at him. I mustn't show anything, must remain gay while I'm really in despair. Peter Vessel, 
and Peter Van Dan have grown into one Peter, who is beloved and good, and for whom I long desperately. Mummy is tiresome, Daddy sweet, and therefore all the more tiresome, Margot the most tiresome because she expects me to wear a pleasant expression, and all I want is to be left in peace. Peter didn't come to me in the attic. He went up to the loft instead and did some carpentry. At every creak and every knock, some of my courage seemed to sleep away and I grew more unhappy. In the distance, a bell was playing, pure in body, pure in soul. Footnote. The bells in old clock towers play tunes. I'm sentimental, I know. I'm desperate and silly, I know that too. Oh, help me. Wednesday, Yours on 1 March, 1944. Dear Kitty, My own affairs have been pushed into the background by a burglary. I'm becoming boring with all my burglars, but what can I do? They seem to take such a delight in honoring Colin and company with their visits. This burglary is much more complicated than the one in July 1943. When Mr. Von Don went to Crawler's office at half-past seven, as usual, he saw that the communicating glass doors and the office door were open. Surprised at this, he walked through and was even more amazed to see that the doors of the little dark room were open too and that there was a terrible mess in the main office. There has been a burglar, he thought to himself at once, and to satisfy himself he went straight downstairs to look at the front door, felt the Yale lock and found everything closed. Oh, then both Pedro and Ellie must have been very slack this evening, he decided. He remained in Crawler's room for a while, then switched off the lamp and went upstairs, without worrying much about either the open doors or the untidy office. This morning, Pedro knocked at our door early and came with the not-so-pleasant news that the front door was wide open. He also told us that the projector and Crawler's new portfolio had both disappeared from the cupboard. Pedro was told to close the door. Von Don told us of his discoveries the previous evening, and we were all awfully worried. What must have happened is that the thief had a skeleton key, because the lock was quite undamaged. He must have crept into the house quite early and closed the door behind him, hidden himself when disturbed by Mr. Von Don, and when he departed fled with his spoils, leaving the door open in his haste. Who can have our key? Why didn't the thief go to the warehouse? Might it be one of our own warehousemen? And would he perhaps betray us since he certainly heard Von Don and perhaps even saw him? It is all very creepy, because we don't know whether the same burglar may not take it into his head to visit us again, or perhaps it gave him a shock to find that there was someone walking about in the house. Yours, Anna. Thursday, 2 March, 1944. Dear Kitty, Margot and I were both up in the attic today, Although we were not able to enjoy it together as I had imagined, still I do know that she shares my feelings over most things. During dishwashing, Ellie began telling Mummy and Mrs. Von Don that she felt very discouraged at times. And what help do you think they gave her? Do you know what Mummy's advice was? She should try to think of all the other people who are in trouble. What is the good of thinking of misery when one is already miserable oneself? I said this, too and was told, you keep out of this sort of conversation. Aren't the grown-ups idiotic and stupid? Just as if Peter, Margot, Ellie, and I don't all feel the same about things, and only a mother's love or that of a very, very good friend can help us. These mothers here just don't understand us at all. Perhaps Mrs. Von Don does a little more than Mummy. Oh, I would so have liked to say something to poor Ellie, something that I know from experience would have helped her, but Daddy aren't came between stupid? us and pushed me aside. We aren't even allowed to have any opinions. People can tell you to keep your mouth shut, but it doesn't stop you having your own opinion. Even if people are still very young, they shouldn't be prevented from saying what they think. Only great love and devotion can help Ellie, Margot, Pater, and me, and none of us gets it. And no one, especially the stupid know-alls here, can understand us, because we are much more sensitive and much more advanced in our thoughts than anyone here would ever imagine in their wildest dreams. Mummy is grumbling again at the moment. She is obviously jealous because I talk more to Mrs. Von Don than to her nowadays. I managed to get hold of Pater this afternoon, and we talked for at least three quarters of an hour. 
Pater had the greatest difficulty in saying anything about himself. It took a long time to draw him out. He told me how often his parents quarrel over politics, cigarettes, and all kinds of things. He was very shy. Then I talked to him about my parents. He defended Daddy. He thought him a first-rate chap. Then we talked about upstairs and downstairs again. He was really rather amazed that we don't always like his parents. Pater, I said, you know I'm always honest, so why shouldn't I tell you that we see their faults too? And among other things, I also said, I would so like to help you, Pater, can't I? You are in such an awkward position, and although you don't say anything, it doesn't mean that you don't care. Oh, I would always welcome your help. Perhaps you would do better to go to Daddy. He wouldn't let anything go any further. Take it from me. You can easily tell him. Yes, he is a real pal. You're very fond of him, aren't you? Pater nodded, and I went on. And he is of you, too. He looked up quickly and blushed. It was really moving to see how these few words pleased him. Do you think so? he asked. Yes, I said. You can easily tell by little things that slip out now and then. Pater is a first-rate chap, too, just like Daddy. Yours, Anna. Friday, 3 March, 1944. Dear Kitty, When I looked into the candle this evening, I felt calm and happy. Footnote. In Jewish homes, candles are lit on the Sabbath eve. Oma seems to be in the candle, and it is Oma, too, who shelters and protects me, and who always makes me feel happy again. But there is someone else who governs all my moods, and that is Pater. When I went up to get potatoes today, and was still standing on the stepladder with the pan, he at once asked, What have you been doing since lunch? I went and sat on the steps, and we started talking. At a quarter past five, an hour later, the potatoes, which had been sitting on the floor in the meantime, finally Pater reached didn't their say destination. Word about his parents. We just talked about books and about the past. The boy has such warmth in his eyes. I believe I'm pretty near to being in love with him. He talked about that this evening. I went into his room after peeling the potatoes and said that I felt hot. You can tell what the temperature is by Margot and me. If it's cold, we are white, and if it is hot, we are red in the face, I said. In love? he asked. Why should I be in love? My answer was rather silly. Why not? he said and then we had to go for supper. Would he have meant anything by that question? I finally managed to ask him today whether he didn't find my chatter a nuisance. He only said, It's okay. I like it. To what extent this answer was just shyness, I am not able to judge. Kitty, I'm just like someone in love who can only talk about her darling, and Pater really is a darling. When shall I be able to tell him so? Naturally, only if he thinks I'm a darling, too. But I'm quite capable of looking after myself, and he knows that very well. And he likes his tranquility, so I have no idea how much he likes me. In any case, we are getting to know each other a bit. I wish we dared to tell each other much more already. Who knows, the time may come sooner than I think. I get an understanding look from him about twice a day. I wink back, and we both feel happy. I certainly seem quite mad to be talking about him being happy, and yet I feel pretty sure that he thinks just the same as I do. Yours, Anna. Saturday, 4 March, 1944. Dear Kitty, this is the first Saturday for months and months that hasn't been boring, dreary, and dull, and Pater is the cause. This morning I went to the attic to hang up my apron when Daddy asked whether I'd like to stay and talk some French. I agreed. First we talked French, and I explained something to Pater. Then we did some English. Daddy read out loud to us from Dickens, and I was in the seventh heaven because I sat on Daddy's chair very close to Pater. I went downstairs at eleven o'clock. When I came upstairs again at half-past eleven, he was already waiting for me on the stairs. We talked until a quarter to one. If, as I leave the room, he gets a chance after a meal, for instance, and if no one can hear... He says, Goodbye, Anna. See you soon. Oh, I am so pleased. 
I wonder if he is going to fall in love with me after all. Anyway, he is a very nice fellow, and no one knows what lovely talks I have with him. Mrs. Von Don quite approves when I go and talk to him, but she asked today teasingly, Can I really trust you two up there together? Of course, I protested. Really, you quite insult me. From morn till night I look forward to seeing Pater. Monday, yours, Six March, Anna. 1944. Dear Kitty, I can tell by Pater's face that he thinks just as much as I do. And when Mrs. Von Don yesterday evening said scoffingly, The thinker, I was irritated. Pater flushed and looked very embarrassed, and I was about to explode. Why can't these people keep their mouths shut? You can't imagine how horrible it is to stand by and see how lonely he is, and yet not be able to do anything. I can so well imagine, just as if I were in his place, how desperate he must feel sometimes in quarrels and in love. Poor Pater, he needs love very much. When he said he didn't need any friends, how harsh the words sounded to my ears. Oh, how mistaken he is. I don't believe he meant it a bit. He clings to his solitude, to his affected indifference and his grown-up ways, but it's just an act, so as never, never to show his real feelings. Poor Pater. How long will he be able to go on playing this role? Surely a terrible outburst must follow as the result of this superhuman effort. Oh, Pater, if only I could help you, if only you would let me. Together we could drive away your loneliness and mine. I think a lot, but I don't say much. I am happy if I see him and if the sun shines when I'm with him. I was very excited yesterday. While I was washing my hair, I knew that he was sitting in the room next to ours. I couldn't do anything about. The more quiet and serious I feel inside, the more noisy I become outwardly. Who will be the first to discover and break through this armor? I'm glad, after all, that the Von Dons have a son and not a daughter— my conquest could never have been so difficult, so beautiful, so good, if I had not happened to hit on someone of the opposite sex. Yours, Anna. P.S. You know that I'm always honest with you, so I must tell you that I actually live from one meeting to the next. I keep hoping to discover that he, too, is waiting for me all the time, and I'm thrilled if I notice a small, shy advance from his side. I believe he'd like to say a lot, just like I would— Little does he know that it's just his clumsiness that attracts me. Yours, Anna.